so the title of this session is is mediating the fragile peace in Northern Ireland, as I'm sure you know. Um, the uh, sort of genesis of it really came from the book that I've written with Yale University Press that was published to commemorate the uh, 100th uh, anniversary of Northern Ireland's existence. So as I'll say a little bit later on, you know, Northern Ireland's now 100 years long. And the question is, how much longer uh, is it going to last in its current form? Well, that's one of the questions. Now, you know, a lot of people would say, uh, well, we're looking forward to the 200th anniversary. And almost just as many, uh, you know, are, are thinking maybe they want to jump ship and, and have some other type of constitutional arrangement. And so there's a big debate now, partly generated by Brexit, which I'll talk about as well, over the future. And this is very typical of a conflict society. We're always very concerned about not just our past, but the way in which our past is remembered and the implications of our past for our present and our future. And a lot of conflict societies, you know, you get a lot of insecurity about identity, and you know where you're going, where your identity is going. And so uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about that over the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, I'll talk for about half an hour, 40 minutes maybe. I'm sure Andrea will stop me if I go on too long. And then, and then we'll have uh, a bit of a Q&A uh, because I'm sure a lot, I know a lot of you, I can see from the chat, you know, are from Ireland. So some of what I'm, I say, you know, you, you may already have heard before many times, but I know, I, you know, I know a lot of people maybe don't have the same um, grounding in in Northern Ireland's uh, internal affairs or or political uh, um, uh, sort of persona. So I'll I'll, I'll crack on and uh, we'll see where we we go. And I just wanted to give you two pictures to start off with. The one on the left hand side is an effigy of somebody called Robert Lundy, and Robert Lundy was the governor of Derry. Um, back in the 17th century, and he advised the local Protestant population to surrender to Catholic G King James II in advance of a big battle, the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 uh, with William of Orange. Uh, and, and ever since then, Robert Lundy's advice has been seen as sort of traitorous. If you call somebody a Lundy in Northern Ireland, everybody in Northern Ireland understands what that means, and it means you're a traitor to your community or you're weak, you know, or you're weak to compromise. And having the strength to compromise in a conflict is a very, very difficult thing to engineer. Uh, it's much easier not to compromise in a conflict because if you compromise, there's a possibility you may be wrong. Uh, you may, um, you know, sell out your community uh, and, and not only your present community, but maybe the memory of people who have died in the service of that identity. So. Ever since then, Robert Lundy's sort of effigy has sometimes been burnt on bonfires um, and, you know, has been seen as a, a sort of a traitor to his own community. So that's the effigy on the left. The, the picture on the right is actually part of a, a, a art installation in Derry as well. So Robert Lundy was governor of Derry, I should have said. And uh, this image on the right is from a, 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 um, an artist, a British artist called Anthony Gormley, who some of you may have heard of. I'm sure you have a very famous British artist and sculptor. And there are three life-size uh, sculptures on Derry's walls that are sort of identical and they're all at different positions in Derry. And, and they're essentially life-size sort of human cruciform uh, that are welded together. And one of them constantly looks out of the city. The other one constantly looks into the city. And to me, they're sort of a metaphor for Northern Ireland politics because to outside observers, they look identical, but they can never see eye to eye. They're always looking away from each other. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think, sort of relevance to the way in which politics takes place in Northern Ireland today through that image. And that is one of the images that I've got in, in the book, partly to try and sort of emphasize the point. Um, and so... <clears throat> Pardon me. So peace is, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, one of my arguments is in the book is that peace is fragile because we're still contesting our past and we're still contesting our politics and our cultural identity. We agreed to differ uh, in the peace process, but we didn't really get an awful lot further down the line 
other than respecting each other's cultures. I should probably also have said that today is quite a momentous day and it's the 12th of July. It's the 12th. This is the 331 years ago. Uh, you know, this is a commemoration of the Battle of the Boyne 331 years ago. And I sometimes joke to people, yes, that, that recently, uh, you know, that's, that's just like the day after yesterday in, in Northern Ireland mindsets. So, um, uh, so it's a sort of a, a key day in Northern Ireland's political diary, if you like. <clears throat> it's quite often a, a time when people take holidays uh, and get out of Northern Ireland, or they will celebrate the 12th. Uh, and that's done normally by the sort of orange uh, loyalist unionist side of the population and the Catholic nationalist Irish side of the population who tend to avoid it. Uh, so it's not so much a sort of festival, it's more a, a sort of a bonding social capital event for the for the unionist side of the, the community. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of, as I said, contestation over identities, and uh, but also insecurity over our contested identities. These identities were seen as um, zero sum, have quite often been seen as zero sum um, options binary options you would either be irish or you'd be british and up until the peace process this was seen as an either or a tug of war a zero sum outcome and one of the the geniuses of the peace process in the 1990s was that we got a bit of wriggle room within that identity space to being able to see our identities as maybe uh neither of those things or both or or, or we had a bit more space about exactly how we defined our identity but anyway, insecurity over these identities has been there since Northern Ireland was created in 1921, 100 years ago. And so we're still mediating those uh, today. Um, the precursor to the 12th of July are, is a thing called 11th Night or Bonfire Night, where there are a lot of bonfires um, in major urban areas. <clears throat> and inevitably that bleeds into politics because sometimes the bonfires are seen as, uh, you know, as, as examples of triumphalism, of, of using history as a weapon in the present, of um, being you know, a public health hazard. These things are massive, these bonfires in you know, urban areas and sort of melt houses that are close to them and so on. So this year, similarly, you know, it's been a point of contention. So the, the political temperature tends to be very high in July, uh, particularly in the 11th and 12th of July. So I'm going to talk about four themes. First of all, there is no history in Northern Ireland, which may surprise you. There are, there are histories. There, are, there is no one accepted narrative. There are different readings, and quite often those readings are in tension with each other or are, as I said, mutually uh, exclusive. Second point is that, <clears throat> pardon me, issues of legitimacy aren't, you know, aren't linear uh, attitudes to the law, the past, even our political institutions that we've got today. They're highly contextual. Uh, they're on a spectrum. Uh, it quite often depends on the context in which they are um, exhibited. So just to give you an example of that, if you had a, a band playing, banging a big drum really? in the middle of a, in the middle of a, you know, a street, it might not have a great political significance where you live. But if you bang that drum outside a Catholic church on the 12th of July, it has a massive political significance because of the context in which the drum is being banged. So uh, I'm not sure if that metaphor really uh, sort of hits home or not, but an awful lot of this is highly contextual. It fluctuates in intensity um, and it comes and goes. Uh, the third point which I make in the book, and I, I try and sort of argue today as well, uh, would be that quite often the, the conflict in Northern Ireland was seen as inevitable. And the, 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 the sort of policy response to the conflict from the 1960s to the 1990s was management. Let's manage this conflict that has no solution. Solutions are for chemists, was one of the sort of trite phrases quite often used by people who didn't want to look for solutions. So in other words, it was sort of seen as a primordial conflict 
that had no uh, denouement. You know, it it couldn't be it couldn't be changed. It could only be managed. Let's get an acceptable level of violence was another one of the public policy phrases that accompanied the conflict. Um, and as somebody who grew up in Belfast, you know, I would argue that there is no acceptable level of violence. And I think you only think there is if you don't live in that conflict. And I think that's probably true regardless of where you live. So my book argues that the last hundred years in Northern Ireland was not inevitable and it was not hopeless. It was a result of structural dynamics structural dynamics that were behind the behavior that then took place, um, as well as ignorance and ambivalence. But to be ignorant uh, is not a defense. If you're a politician and you say, well, I don't really know what's going on there. Well, you've got a responsibility to understand it and do something about it. So being ambivalent, being ignorant is not really, as much far as I'm concerned, a, a reasonable defense. And the fourth point that as part of my own sort of academic, I suppose, um, starting point really, is that politics is not the preserve of politicians in Northern Ireland or anywhere else. And it's not just about formal political structures. It's much more holistic than that. Uh, politics is done by all of us, uh, whether we vote, whether we don't vote. And one of the things that really irks me is people who say to me, oh, I'm not political, I don't vote. Because that's one of the most political things you can do by not voting, because it opens the arena for people who maybe have, have other particular viewpoints and, and can therefore get those expressed because you do not um, participate. So um, politics, whether it's conflict or whether it's peace, we're all in it and we're all doing it and we're all part of this narrative uh, on both sides of this equation. And I think that Northern Ireland has exhibited that, is exhibiting it today with um, certain political difficulties we may come on to. It's not just the politicians who are active. It's members of the community, it's people in civic society uh, who also were critical to the peace process as well. So <clears throat> we're all sort of players here is, is one, one of the things I would, I would uh, argue. And I, I think that also has not been linear either. That's evolved and fluctuated as well uh, in, 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 in relation to the, the violence and in relation to the political process uh, that's followed that. Just wanted to, for anybody who doesn't really sort of get, have much of a grip on the the political and cultural dimensions of this, I just wanted to show you two wall murals, to just pictorially try and give you an example of the differences between, and this is very simplistic, um, so apologies if you've got a more nuanced sort of take, um, but the mural on the left is uh, in an Irish Republican area of Belfast, and you can pretty much understand that it's from the sort of Catholic nationalist Irish side of the fence. Firstly, because Ireland is on the wall mural and no loyalist uh, Protestant mural would have the word Ireland on it. It would probably have Ulster on it. It might have Northern Ireland on it, but it certainly wouldn't have Ireland. Secondly, the pictorially there, you can see that Ireland is the island of Ireland. It's not Northern Ireland. There's no line partitioning Ireland there as Northern Ireland was partitioned in 1921. That northern bit where that lily is there, the blossom of the lily, that's pretty much where the border is. You've also got the four provinces of Ireland and those little shields on the corners there. And the other dead giveaway is that, that building on the top of the thing is supposed to be the general post office in Dublin and the Easter Rising in 1916 when Irish rebels took on the British army. And eventually that led to Irish independence and you can see the phoenix that's a phoenix rising from the flames of the gpo supposed to represent you know the, a political victory coming out of the ashes of military defeat so that's very clearly a sort of a nationalist memorial there and on the other side you've got obviously a, a loyalist protestant mural harking back to the past and of course you've got 1690 the date of the battle of the boyne you've got king william of orange there on his white steed charging into battle supposedly to liberate the protestant population that's not at all what he was at but in terms of protestant folklore it's gone down as you know a savior of the protest of protestantism against catholic uh, king james the second you've also got the crown and uh, the british crown represented in that wall mural again that's something you would never get on an irish republican mural unless it was satirical and you've got the northern ireland flag there as well so 
those are just I try to pictorially give you a sort of a very quick, uh, you know, one side and the other side and how they how they might define themselves. The the reality is much more complicated than that, but that's the sort of the, the polar opposites, if you like. And I just wanted to, uh, this might surprise you, sort of a reference to um, Maya Angelou, who uh, used this quote in Bill Clinton's inaugural uh, inauguration in 1993. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but a face with courage need not be lived again. And that's really where Northern Ireland is. You know, we're, we're, we're constantly trying not to live our you know live our past again um but but it's a bit like groundhog day we keep getting dragged back into our past and we can't we haven't quite separated our past and our present and the reason for that is because the past is not some sort of neutral cultural um event or series of events the past is still alive and it's still part of the contemporary political debate and therefore we cannot just consign the past to the cultural realm, uh, it is still part of the political. So I would say to understand what's happening in Northern Ireland, you do have to have a working knowledge of the past. And to understand Brexit, to understand why unionists, for instance, are worried by Brexit, I think you have to grasp uh, you know, the legacy of partition, uh, the last hundred years uh, of insecurity of both unionists and nationalists living in Northern Ireland. Uh, you have to have some sort of grip on it. And as I said already, the past seeps into lots of other aspects of life, not just the formal political um, structures, but also our cultural uh, our cultural um, practices, our social lives, even our geography. Uh, so sometimes in the book, I've tried to use poetry and music to, to try and demonstrate how culture and helps us frame these narratives of legitimacy and belonging. Quite often the arts can become a, a reservoir or a, you know, a, a library of our, of our past. It's sort of, we, we sort of, um, that's, that's the medium through which we quite often remember our past. And certainly music and poetry have done that in the case of Northern Ireland. <clears throat> Just to, um, <clears throat> pardon me. Just to, uh, get, again, connect this with where we are now. Um, as I said, today is the 12th. Yesterday was the 11th bonfire night. Some of them were done on, on Saturday night as well. Um, and this is a commemoration. And for, for a lot of, of, of unionists, this is a cultural event. You know, it, it, the bonfires, they're there to commemorate uh, William's arrival into Ulster in 1690 to celebrate William's arrival. Um, but uh, and, and you know, but but a lot of um, contemporary examples of this, you know, they, they are quite often they've become, um, I suppose, focal points for contemporary political grievances. And you can see on the bottom left photograph there, hopefully, you know, the Irish tricolor is quite often burnt on these uh, bonfires. Uh, there's Brexit there on that one. There's the European flag, which is a recent addition to the hate, uh, hate figures of, uh, of loyalist community. And sometimes you get effigies of politicians or the faces of Catholic nationalist politicians, not just nationalist ones, but you know political hate figures, their images would be there and they'd be burnt. And uh, uh, the other sort of dimension of this is that it, it is a, it is a, a social event in, in Belfast, and not just in Belfast, but you know it's a, it's a quite a rambunctious evening as you can you can imagine, as a big party for the people who 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 feel comfortable to go there, uh, but it's very divisive. You know, this is not a cross community event. Uh, these are very this is very much bonding social capital of the Ulster Unionist or the Loyalist community, and it's not bridging social capital that connects with the two communities. Um, and there's just an image on the right there of of uh, the bonfires on in Belfast and people watching them. And for them, it's a, you know, it's a celebration. It's a party night. Um, and you've got this yin and yang between is this culture or is this sectarian hatred? And, and you know, people are on different sides of that fence. And they certainly are this week and they were yesterday in Northern Ireland. And then it, 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 that then makes it very difficult for politicians to just stand aloof from this. And so 
nationals, it was a nationals politician a few days ago tried to ban one of these bonfires in an interface area where you have Catholics and Protestants living side by side, saying that it was, you know, it was, that, that it was her responsibility as a government, as a minister at Stormont uh, and her department owned the land on the bonfire, said so the bonfire can't go ahead. The police refused to um, intervene. <clears throat> the politician then took the police to court and the court ruled against the politician. M meanwhile, the loyalist politician said the, the bonfire should go ahead because it was a tradition. And so you've got this, you know, standoff and binary dynamic going on, which is very, you know, unhelpful, really. And so now we've got the latest of these sort of problems, I suppose, uh, is that we've got Brexit and we've got the Northern Ireland Protocol. And that has also dra dragged in issues of identity, whether we're British, whether we're Irish, whether we're some sort of an amalgam between the two. And that has also destabilised the political events, as you can see from the European flag on the bonfire. And it's also brought, uh, you know, it, it's, it's brought into sort of crystal clear um, uh, d discussion about what country do we actually live in? Now, in Northern Ireland, they voted to remain in the European Union by quite, a, by quite an amount, by 56% to 44% to stay in the EU. But of course, this was not a devolved matter. This was a matter for the United Kingdom as a country. So Brexit really defined the United Kingdom as a single country and uh, the United Kingdom would leave the EU as a single country. But the peace process had 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 has said that you know I've provided space for a lot of people in Northern Ireland to say that they weren't British, they were actually Irish, and to be recognized as being Irish and not British, and to confuse exactly what their country was <clears throat> or where it was going ultimately. So it really sort of imposed a binary identity on a society that didn't really need a binary identity, it a much more multifaceted type of identity than that. Um, political unionism supported Brexit, certainly after the vote in, in June 2000, uh, 2016. Uh, they supported this process, but they've now found themselves getting a, the Brexit they didn't want. Things haven't really panned out the way they thought they would. And that's been very um, da uh, existentially <clears throat> uh, damaging for a lot of the unionist community. So the unionists are now seeking to oppose British policy on Brexit, but they're looking back to the past in terms of how to actually get rid of this horrible policy they don't want. So they're looking back to Northern Ireland's creation when they fought, you know, when the <clears throat> they opposed Home Rule. Um, they uh, formed a, a militia, an armed militia, to oppose British policy at the start of the twentieth century. Um, they're also looking back to period 30 years ago when they also when British did things they didn't like. So they're trying to look for ways that worked in the past, um, which isn't necessarily an ideal way of doing it. But <clears throat> our past is always in front of us, one journalist very cleverly said, and I think it's very sort of <clears throat> very true that we're always sort of looking back to um, what worked the last time there was a crisis? And this was a, <clears throat> um, a sort of a protest at Storm in Parliament about the border when there was a worry that Brexit would put a border in Ireland between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. And since the peace process, the border in Ireland that partitioned the country um, has been invisible, really. It's grown into being invisible. And the worry of nationalists was that this border would come back again. And the, the photograph underneath that is being when the border suddenly shifted to being in the Irish Sea between Britain and Northern Ireland. And that has really annoyed the unionist Protestant side of the fence. So to understand unionism and why they're afraid of Brexit and the, pro and the protocol aspect, uh, you can look back to the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985 or Home Rule at the beginning of the 20th century, as I said. Um, and there's a lot of emotion, a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness and almost existential fear sort of swirling around uh, while you've also got a sort of a nitty gritty legalistic policy debate going on. 
Um, but the but the combustible aspects of it aren't really so much the detail as the uh, the wider uh, sort of dimensions of of mistrust and a sense of uh, you know it another crisis that's connected to previous crises in the you know in the in the iconography if you like. Now uh, there was a a poet called John Hewitt who's now uh, died, but. He wrote a poem in response to the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. And you could almost take this poem, I think, and just plonk it straight into today in terms of how unionists are reacting to Brexit. That's a picture of John Hewitt there on the top left. And this is the poem there. It's quite a short one, but it says, These days the air is thick with bitter cries as baffled thousands dream they are betrayed. Stripped of the comfort of safe loyalties, their ancient friends considered enemies, alone among the nations and afraid. So that's not a triumphalist poem. That's quite a fearful poem. And on the right-hand side of the screen there, you can see protests against the Anglo-Irish Agreement when the British government gave the Irish government a, a consultative role in Northern Ireland. And as far as the Unionists were concerned, this was damaging the sovereignty of the United Kingdom and their place in the United Kingdom. A little bit like how the Gibraltarians feel. You know, the people in Gibraltar feel very nervous about whether their status will be changed and that Spain will be given rights over Gibraltar. And therefore, you know, you exhibit your culture to, to maybe, a, a, you know, a level that wouldn't be uh, reciprocated if you, if you were, or wouldn't be, wouldn't be the same if you were a bit more secure. So there was an Ulster Says No campaign. There were strikes. It was a big day of action. You can see a big mass protest in Belfast in the bottom right there. But ultimately, this campaign failed. It failed to change British policy, but it really rammed home to a lot of unionists that that uh, you know this was another example of 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 the British government being fair weather friends of the union. And Brexit brings us right back to 1985. And here we've got two characters, two figures in the on the unionist side who've both been very vocal against. This Northern Ireland Protocol, this is Ian Paisley Jr. speaking in the House of Commons. The protocol has betrayed us, made us feel like foreigners in our own country. The Prime Minister be the unionist we need you to be. And the problem that unionists have got is that Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, is, you know, is unlikely to be the unionist that they want him to be because he needs a deal with the European Union. He needs a deal with the Irish government. And he needs to be on good terms with the American president. And those people are probably much more uh, significant than the unionist community in Northern Ireland to Boris Johnson. The person in the bottom of the photograph there is um, David Campbell, who's chair of uh, the LCC, which is sort of an umbrella group that is linked to the loyalist paramilitary groups. And again, this is sort of warning about the possibility of violence as a result of the protocol, violence coming back. And he would say, that this is not a threat, this is a warning. And a lot of people sort of saw this as a threat. And again, in conflict situations, you may say something and say, well, I'm only warning, this is just my best guess. But in conflicts, we take the worst case scenario and, and uh, might think that this is, there's a bit more leverage being used here than just a sort of fact, factual explanation. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, there's a, there's a sort of whiff of violence that is now uh, sort of crept its way into the negotiations between Britain and the European Union over the extension of, of uh, you know, uh, grace periods over trade uh, to mitigate some of the, the problems in Northern Ireland that have resulted. So we're, we're just past the 100 years. Uh, we're two months into the second century. And I think Brexit has has sort of thrown a lot of the things up into the air in terms of where Northern Ireland goes now. Um, I think that that there's a lot of talk now about constitutional change that wasn't there before Brexit. Whether you are a Brexit supporter or not, it certainly throw you know up upturned a lot of uh, apple carts. And I think 2016 is you know holds its own in, in that sort of in the calendar of important dates in Northern Ireland's history. Those are just some of them. 1921 when it was created, 68 when politics started disintegrating and went on to the streets and the civil rights movement turned into um, more of a, a street uh, 
uh, rioting between uh, nationalists and unionists. It's 1972 when the storm in Parliament was suspended by London. 85 the Anglo Irish Agreement. 1998 you had the Good Friday Agreement or Belfast Agreement. 2016 you had Brexit. 2021 you've got the centenary of Northern Ireland. So I think Brexit really does um, uh, hold its own. So we're just past the centenary. As I said, some cheered, some booed. Most people in Britain didn't care or didn't know. Uh, and, and um, you know, a lot of people in Northern Ireland wanted to celebrate the fact that Northern Ireland, you know, it's a big landmark. But the nationalist side of the population said there was nothing to celebrate 100 years of partition of the country. Um, and it, again, it's sort of, shone a spotlight onto something that's causing a lot of um, friction. Uh, and one of the, I suppose one of the points I wanted to make was that the, it's the ambiguity, uh, or some called it constructive ambiguity, but there's been a lot of ambiguity in the peace process in Northern Ireland. And uh, where, when that ambiguity disappears, then you have a lot more friction and zero sum equations going on. Now, some people may say, well, ambiguity leads to uh, confusion over over where you're going. But but it was it was a, a very important sort of dimension, I think, to uh, the peace process itself. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, we had the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement in 1998. That's a picture of David Trimble and John Hume at the bottom there. That David Trimble was the leader of the largest unionist party at the time. John Hume was leader of the largest nationalist party at the time. Um, <clears throat> the, those political dimensions have changed since, but um, the good, like every peace agreement probably ever been signed, you know, it was not perfect. It was an imperfect compromise. It was based on constructive ambiguity. It was the space between yes and no. It was the maybe in that in that top picture there. Uh, people, enough people saw enough in it to vote for it and support it, but no side got everything that they wanted and had to actually accept a lot of things they didn't particularly want. And uh, I suppose that that's endemic to negotiated peace settlements. Uh, they are inevitably compromises. Um, it parked the final political destination of Northern Ireland, whether it was British or whether it was Irish, it parked that quite cleverly for the future and it set up political institutions for the present and said, well, the future of Northern Ireland is up to the people to determine. Um, but for now, we will, you know, the status quo will prevail. So it left out some difficult issues, such as the decommissioning of illegal weapons and the future of the police. It, you know, it left this precise dynamics of those out for another day. Um, because if they hadn't have done, they wouldn't have had an agreement in the first place. So again, that's another example of the imperfections of political settlements, you can only use so much. But another crucial part, part, part of this is it wasn't just given to the, you know, to, to Northern Ireland to accept. It was voted for in referendums in Northern Ireland and in the Irish Republic. And, you know, a big mandate was provided in both, in both, in both administrations. 71% of people in Northern Ireland voted for the Good Friday Agreement. And 95% of people in the Republic that 71% is slightly uh, masks the fact that much, many more nas nationalists were supportive of the Good Friday Agreement than unionists. The figure among unionism was much more 50-50 than the figure in, in nationalism. So, but overall, 71% of people supported it. And so we're over a quarter of a century in to the peace process. Uh, but we've really sort of failed to tackle a lot of the sort of dynamics of the conflict. Sectarianism, as you can see from the pictures I put up earlier, you know, sectarianism is still strong. The devolved institutions are still brittle. Um, they failed really to get a grip of sectarianism. They've really failed to uh, get past respecting the two traditions into providing uh, incentives to build uh, bridges across into the different traditions. 
Um, power sharing, as I said, provided few incentives for cooperation. It's, it's been a very good system to prevent things happening that you don't like happening, but it's been very, it's been less nimble at um, providing incentives to, uh, to, you know, reach across to the community who you mistrust. Uh, the other thing about this, uh, the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement is it really hasn't made a massive difference to people's lives. And I think that's another typical uh, example in, in negotiated settlements. It's very difficult to get it to filter through in, in a way that really people feel there's a peace dividend and really change their day-to-day -day lives. And I would, I would make an argument that the Good Friday Agreement hasn't done that. It set up institutions, but it hasn't really done a lot more than that. And one of the reasons is because we've agreed to differ on whether Northern Ireland is British or Irish, but we haven't agreed to agree on very much. We've agreed to respect each other and that we, you know, we fall off the wagon now and again, uh, but we haven't agreed to go much further towards reconciliation or even define what that is. Now, this is a photograph from, I'll just, I'll stop talking in a couple of minutes because I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm running up against uh, my, my, my time, uh, my time uh, allocation. This is a picture of Tony Blair, former British Prime Minister, just after the Good Friday Agreement was signed with the Irish Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern. And this is the 10th of April, 1998. They gave a press conference and he said, the essence of what we have agreed is a choice. We are all winners or all losers. It's mutually assured benefit or mutually assured destruction. And Blair, I think, thought, well, most sensible people will choose mutually assured benefit. Who would choose mutually assured destruction? But in conflicts, you don't get an either or. You quite often get both of those things happening simultaneously or in a more complicated type of pattern. And I think that's where Northern Ireland is now. We've, you know, we're no, this is never going to be a binary. Northern Ireland's currently got a bit of both. Uh, depending on what month it is, uh, maybe what time of day. So, you know, we can hold both of these things uh, simultaneously. We've now got new problems, as I said, with Brexit. I've already talked about that. Don't want to say too much more about that. Uh, but, but Brexit squeezed the space between nationalists who said that Northern Ireland is unique. It's different from the rest of the United Kingdom. And should, you know, Northern Ireland shouldn't just be whipped out of the European Union against its will. Uh, having its self-determination sort of squashed by London. And unionists claimed their country was the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom voted for Brexit, and that the whole country should come out of the EU in the same way. And so it pushed these two groups, well, they're already apart, but it pushed them even further apart. Um, uh, just want to go through that, I think. Um, just yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit about the wider context here because, again, I think this is germane to conflicted societies in lots of other places, not just Northern Ireland. But um, the wider context is also relevant here because you, the conflict wasn't just um, prosecuted by people inside Northern Ireland. There were other players involved. Uh, you had the government, you had the Irish Republic for a start. You had the United Kingdom secondary, secondarily. You had the United States and you had the European Union. And all of these groups were maybe indirect actors in the conflict and in the peace process. And one of the key sort of foundations to the peace process has been the relationship between the United Kingdom and the Irish Republic. In other words, the, the part of Ireland that was not in Northern Ireland became independent after uh um 1921 the top picture there uh was taken before brexit that's the queen meeting the former commander of the ira martin mcginnis now deceased as well as peter robinson beside him the first minister martin mcginnis there was deputy first minister peter robinson was first minister if you had said in 1975 or 1985 that these two people would have been in government together you probably would have been committed to a mental asylum or that Martin McGuinness would have sh uh, sh shook the hand of the Queen, or she would have shook his hand. You would similarly have been carted off, I think, for medical uh, attention. Uh, the Queen, of course, being the commander in chief of the, the UK Armed Forces, head of state, uh, the IRA having killed Lord Mountbatten and uh, several, uh, not several, hundreds of members of the British Army. So uh, this was again a part of you know a signal of 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 a warming up of the Anglo-Irish relationship. 
uh, and that was very important to the internal politics of Northern Ireland, I think. Um, and it wasn't just that. We had state visits to Ireland and we had state visits from the Irish president to the United Kingdom. These things just wouldn't have happened during the conflict. And these allowed a lot of tensions between over Northern Ireland to be dealt with uh, away from the glare of the public spotlight and from press releases and public disagreements. There were certainly disagreements between the governments, but they were quite often in-house and argued through. And not always, but but that would be the most of the most of the time. Since Brexit, the relationship's been much chillier. And that's partly because the interests of Ireland and the interests of the United Kingdom are different now. Ireland is a member state of the European Union and the United Kingdom isn't. And that is, I think, slowly changing the political relationship between these two countries. Uh, and Northern Ireland is only going to suffer as a consequence of that as time progresses. And you can see that with the protocol and with Brexit and with the negotiations, that Northern Ireland has become the collateral damage of Brexit and will continue to, 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 to have that. And, the reason I wanted to talk about this was we quite often see peace settlements and negotiations as, as, as you know, uh, you know, the, the day in which the thing is signed or the press conference when people come out of the negotiating chamber uh, and, and say nice things to one another. Uh, but they wouldn't get there if it wasn't for the building blocks and the structural dimensions that surround that and the pre-negotiations, of course, that take place. And I, I have in the past, I've compared this to... Um, you know, if you're looking at, I don't know where you live, you're in Italy, you're in, in, in Ethiopia, and you're in different parts of the world. But whatever part of the world you're in, there will be poor people and rich people. And if you go to where the rich people live and look at their houses, you're very unlikely to say, look at the lovely foundations in that mansion. Aren't they beautiful? Aren't they fabulous? How do they hold that house up? You're probably more likely to say, look at the lovely balcony and the beautiful fountain coming out of that mansion. But without the foundations, that house would be a pile of rubble in the grounds of the building and uh, the property and it's exactly the same with politics if you don't have the foundations laid for negotiations for trust building over time uh then you you're going to get uh you know agreements built on very shaky ground uh, that will crumble subsequently so my worry really at the moment is that uh, unless anglo-irish relations improve significantly uh, that relationships in Northern Ireland are going to suffer as a result. Uh, some good news, because most of you have heard of a depressing uh, talk. Um, one of the areas where there has been agreement in Northern Ireland has been over public health and over COVID. As you know, COVID does not discriminate over your religion or over your political identity. It is quite willing to kill you regardless of whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant or a British or Irish or whatever. And it's been one of the few examples where the politicians and general population have, and there have been some tensions over whether you would align with England or whether you would align with Dublin, but generally there's been a common cause and that common cause has been to keep people alive in Northern Ireland and keep the, you know, keep the rate of infection down. It hasn't really been sectarianized, at, you know, only on the margins. Um, and, and, you know, everybody has been regarded as a citizen uh, rather than as being a member of a specific community. It's been one of the few examples I can think of where the governing power sharing executive has really got its act together and actually has a, has a, has a record which is better than the record in England. Uh, and similarly, the Scottish have a record that's better in England and surprisingly Wales, you know, unsurprisingly Wales has a record that's better in England. So the devolved regions seem to be handling their public health well, and I, that's a picture of Robin Swan, who's a unionist, but he's health minister. And there's a lot of people saying he's health minister. He's not a unionist politician, you know, and he's doing a good job as health minister. And really, Northern Ireland needs a lot more of that. It leads more common purpose uh, over what their project is. And un unless they get that, then it's going to remain brittle and it's going to remain fragile. Uh, so just to finish off, um, I think Brexit has 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 led to a lot of internal strife within unionism. There's a different political leaders. We can talk about that in the questions if you want. Uh, the question about whether Northern Ireland should actually reunify with the rest of Ireland is now a live issue. There's, I would I would put certainly you know a couple of pound 
on uh, I would bet a couple of pounds that there would be referendums on independence in Northern Ireland and Scotland in the next decade. I don't know what the results of those will be, but um, for the day to day, we're going to be focusing on our identity politics, I think, because of the protocol, because of Brexit and the, and the collateral damage that's being caused. Uh, let's finish off. Um, Northern, of course, Northern Ireland's evolving and changing. Every, every region does. And how that's managed will really determine whether how violent Northern Ireland gets or if it gets more violent or if it gets more unstable. Uh, regardless of what people want, they're going to have to pursue it politically and they're going to have to convince those who are unconvinced of their case. And uh, there is a large and growing electorate of non-aligned people, probably certainly 15 percent or so. Uh, and the irony, the ultimate irony is that it won't be unionists or nationalists who determine the future of Northern Ireland. It will be the undecideds who decide. Uh, it will be that central group and it will be the whoever sort of comes out on top of the, a border poll will be who attracts the most support from the currently non-aligned sector of the population as to whether you want the union and the status quo to remain or whether you want some form of Irish reunification to take place. So I will stop talking there because I'm sure I've talked for 40 minutes or so. And just thank you for putting up with it. And I hope you understood my accent. And um, if you want to find out more about the book, then there's a link there on the slides to it. Just go on uh, Yale University Press's website and you'll find it. And I'll, I'll uh, be happy to just have some questions if there are any. Thanks. You have questions. Thank you so much, Virgil. And everybody who has questions can either directly ask them or, or write them in the chat and I can read it out. I think there was a lot of information. So maybe all questions are already answered. Yeah? Francesca. Yes, hello. I I have several questions, but I'll start with one. How do the unionists rationalize um, the fact that the government in Westminster actually preferred to, to strike an agreement with the European Union through the um, Northern Ireland protocol than safeguard their, uh, the unity with the Northern Irish, with the Unionists? Yeah, oh, that's a great question, I would say. Um, I, there's a couple of different ways they rationalise it. One is they would blame Johnson as being uh, untrustworthy. You know, if there was a bit of sort of personal blame they would attach to him, there, there is that dimension. But I think that's probably less the case that I think the stronger rationalization there is that they would see they would rationalize it by saying that the Irish government sort of forced Boris Johnson to do to sign the protocol and to put a trade border in the Irish Sea um, because they were playing hardball they were then they were using Northern Ireland as a as a if you like as a weapon in brexit in the brexit negotiations so a lot of unionists blame Dublin for pressure you know for for playing you know for playing hardball in negotiations and that the european and the problem european union as well and and michel barnier and, and and so on for taking that position and that left the uk government with very little option other than a no deal brexit they had to accept a border in the rsc so they would say that he didn't want the border in the rsc but he was forced to accept one as a price of getting a deal with the European Union, that's probably how most unionists would, would, would um, I think, sort of rationalise it. Um, certainly, those on the Brexit side of the equation, but of course, there's plenty of unionists who are remainers, and the unionist remainers may uh, be slightly less charitable towards Boris Johnson than maybe some of the Brexiteers would be. Any other questions? 
I see, I see one Netflix in the chat. Stuff, yeah. yeah, there is. Um, what do you think the chances or um, are of increased paramilitary activity in the future? What with Brexit, possible future referendums, etc. <sighs> I mean, it's a tricky one that I think to answer. Um, we ha have certainly seen a, a rise of skirmishing, street violence, rioting. The paramilitary groups are still there in Northern Ireland. Um, the loyalist paramilitaries lost their political project before Brexit, really. They were much more about, um, you know, uh, racketeering, drugs trafficking, low-level criminal activity, rather than being a political, uh, having a political dynamic. And there's a lot of faction fighting between them. But I think Brexit and the protocol have actually given the loyalist paramilitary groups more of a political project than they had before. And I think they are orchestrating um, rioting, and they had been in, at Easter time. Uh, but it's very difficult at the same time for loyalist paramilitaries to, if you like, sort of tool themselves up for a war, because who are they going to have a war with? Provisional IRA are not active. They would be easily cast as domestic terrorists fighting in support of Britain and, you know, fighting the British government against, you know, it doesn't really make an awful lot of sense uh, as a sort of a political ideology in terms of reactivating violence, because they had previously said they were defensive They were a counter-revolutionary movement and they were sort of providing security when the British government wouldn't do it uh, against this sort of Irish Republican uh, military threat. So I think the capacity is increasing, though, having said that, I think the, the sort of the capacity for loyalist violence and the excuse for it, if you like, is expanding and they're happy to move into that space, I think. Uh, there are, of course, dissident Republicans or dissident, Republicans. You know, not everybody agrees with that phrase, but let's say militant Republicans still exist people who think Sinn Féin an Irish Republicanism sort of compromised uh, for too little you know the revolution did not happen um, and they are still there and they are looking for opportunities and becoming more sophisticated um, but there's almost zero support for them in the community in the nationalist community <clears throat> so um, so um, I don't really think there's going to be a large upsurge of violence I think it's much more likely to have a sort of a an ongoing sectarian um, uh, sporadic rioting type of uh, future, uh, which isn't uh, which isn't which isn't a very optimistic scenario. But uh, if you're looking at fatalities, Northern Ireland is still a very safe place, probably one of the most safe places in the United Kingdom. Uh, knife crime in London is way worse than uh, ethno-national violence in Northern Ireland. And, the, and also the other probably important dimension of the violence in Northern Ireland, which I don't want to harp on about this too long, but um, the violence is much more inwardly directed by both sets of militants, if you like. So previously in the 1970s and 80s, it was very much sort of across the ethno-national, you know, it was a war across. Now it's a war within. It's a war for control, turf war, uh, money, you know, war economies. It's really about that and antisocial behavior and so on and keeping the police out of your business. And um, a lot of the violence is inwardly directed rather than directed across. And the, the political impact of that's very important uh, because then it doesn't result in a tit for tat type of violence where one side attacks the other side, the other side then attacks you back again and on and on it rumbles. And so, but even, even with that, I think the violence is still very, very low in terms of fatalities, even though sectarianism is very strong in Northern Ireland. So that's a, quite a long winded answer to the question. It was a very good question, but um, there was a secondary question, wasn't there, there that I sort of missed, uh, moving away from the past, wasn't it? Um, Yeah, yeah uh, in the chat, uh, that is the question yes. of Anne, uh, who wrote, what would be the chances of moving away from the past and polit political positions to considering alternatives on a commercial or other basis? Mediation is about finding a solution for the future without the problems of the past, for example, without attempting to solve all issues. 
Yeah, absolutely. And of course, one of the one of the things I'm sure everybody knows about mediation is that it, it is not a it is it is not a, a magic pill. You know, it is a it's, it's, it's a mechanism and there has to be uh, willingness and conditions that are conducive to a positive outcome. And, uh, you know, applying a process externally uh, is going to have very limited value. I think in a society that's driven by much more local level dynamics, um, I, I I don't want to be hopeless, but I'm quite you know I, I might sound quite pessimistic. I'm very optimistic about Northern Ireland's future. Actually, in the in the big picture, um, I, I I once asked a journalist, "What's the best thing about the peace process in Northern Ireland?" Well, it was right in the book. Actually, I said, "You know, is it the power sharing or is it this Anglo-Irish relationship?" He says, no, it's the motorway between London and or the motorway between Dublin and Belfast. That's the most practical thing that's really helped because you could live in Dublin and work in Belfast or vice versa. Or it's actually resulted in a big organic connection that did like when I was a kid living in Belfast, you would maybe see one car from the Irish Republic a day, if that, maybe one a week, partly because nobody wanted to be in a bomb scare and you know there was nothing open anyway. So why would you come north? But since the peace process, the motorway shortened the distance between the two, made it much easier. You could commute. There were things open uh, to go to. Uh, tourism massively increased between north and south. And it's in those organic uh, sort of drip in the bucket type wins that the future is going to be achieved, in my opinion, not not formal mediation processes, certainly from the outside into Northern Ireland, and that's not going to really go anywhere. The other sort of aspect I would I would sort of suggest is that I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the Good Friday Agreement. I voted for it in 1998. And one of the last things I did when I lived there was vote for the Good Friday Agreement and then went to England to work. And I've, I went to England for six months to work and I'm still here 20 odd years later. Um, which is a typical story for a lot of people. But um, uh, I think the crucial thing for widening space, widening the political space is for the institutions to survive and for the institutions to establish a a, a working relationship. Not to to say that elites are, are critical, but they set, they quite often set the agenda. They provide the leadership uh, or they have to, they should be providing leadership uh, for their electorates and potential electorates to 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 to, to, uh, to sort of think their way into. And I, I think it was very noticeable um, in the sort of decade from two thousand and eight to twenty eighteen or twenty seventeen, maybe two thousand and seven to twenty seventeen. Uh, it broke down for three years after twenty seventeen, but we'll leave that aside because it doesn't suit my argument. But um, uh, for that 10 years, a lot of the attention in Northern Ireland went away from identities. This is before Brexit, obviously. And it went away from whether we're British or Irish. And it went into things like, is, the, is, the, is there going to be a selection test for my child at age 11 to get to secondary school? Is the local post office, office going to close? What, what, you know, is the health service? Why is the waiting list so long? Uh, are we going to get water charges the way they've got in Britain? How, you know, public money, is it being wasted? Uh, those sorts of practical questions. And George Mitchell, who was the mediator, who you'll all know, I'm sure, you know, he, he said, my dream is someday I go back to Northern Ireland, I sit in the gallery and I listen to a very boring debate about normal politics. And that's what he, exactly what he did 10 years after, the in 2008, he went back to Northern Ireland with his son who was born during the negotiations. And he took him back and he sat in the gallery and he listened to some really, really boring normal political discussion about dog licenses or something <clears throat> and uh, his son turned to him and said dad can we go because it's really boring and he said at that moment I realized that you know my job my work was done I'm paraphrasing slightly but it's it, you know so the institutions are critical I think to getting some sort of joint enterprise that at least sets out a vision of of cooperation and 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 uh, joint purpose and without that i think northern ireland really does risk picking at its scabs uh, pardon my meta- horrible metaphor of its sort of identity crisis and blame culture 
uh, and not really thinking about, um, well, you know, why do I support that political philosophy? What is it giving me, my family, my community? You know, how are we benefiting from this particular? Will I will I change my vote at the next election and so on? And I think that's where the space will be widened for us to move away from traditional sort of mindsets. Sorry, my questions are, are, are my answers are very very long. Apologies. And <laughs> um, Jana. Yes, uh, thank you. It's a very basic question. And uh, actually, in your last statement, you just touched upon it a little bit. It's it's rather on the pragmatic side of the mediation. So do you have any insights into how the process is led? Is there, I mean, um, like um, an international mediator uh, training high level politicians, um, training like um, or, or talking to however you want to phrase it, to both sides um, on a more or less day-to-day -day basis or just up front of, an, of a national agreement? Or is it, how is it working really process-wise? Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, and I, I suppose if, if I was looking for one thing that is missing or would, would be really useful, it would be the problem solving aspects after the political settlement is reached. You know, there was so, the, the Good Friday Agreement and the mediation was so sort of high level and it was so ambiguous as to exactly what the timetables were and who would do what and when they would do it, that there wasn't enough political capital or time given to, um, I think, uh, addressing the mistrust that then very, very easily crept back into that relationship. Uh, and, and of course, what that meant was that the, it became very difficult for the politicians to um, trust their opponent. There wasn't enough support for that, I don't think. And, and the unionists, so that picture I showed you of David Trimble, as you might know, he was, he was sort of, his party was eclipsed by a party that actually opposed the whole peace process. Ian Paisley's party, the DUP, that's now the largest party in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, certainly, it's the, they've got the first minister. They, they moved into supporting it when they became the largest party. But ethnic outbidding became very easy. And, 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 and that certainly happened. And so I think in terms of the sort of the, the model, if you like, um, it was very skillful in Northern Ireland. And George Mitchell was very skillful. Uh, because this was a mediation that succeeded when the parties wouldn't even talk directly to one another. Uh, the unionists wouldn't speak directly to Sinn Féin right up until the Good Friday Agreement was signed or reached in April 1998. That's two years of non-communication, yet they still managed to process through proxy mediation, you know, and through other bilateral, you know, they had lots of... so. It's quite a complicated type of, I think it was just, let's get people in a room face to face and, and mediate. That's never going to work in a, in a conflict like Northern Ireland. It was much more fractured than that, where you had, let's say, the patron state of both sides, the British and the Irish, both in the mediation. Uh, they almost took on the negotiation, sort of, uh, they were the sort of negotiating On, on each on different sides, if you like, trying to get movement. Um, you also had informally members of the paramilitary groups present in the mediation unofficially um, to, um, I think, provide moral support, but also to watch and make sure people didn't go ahead of their communities and so on. So that wasn't part of any official model, but if they hadn't been there, then arguably uh, the, the mediators, the people in the mediation wouldn't have felt sufficiently secure to sign up to what they were doing. So there were lots of components there that were lots of moving parts, not all of which are in any theory that I'm aware of. It was quite bespoke. Um, it was quite multi uh, multifaceted. So I think, again, rather than having some sense of a a mediation that's just one conversation, having lots of different layers of it, where you mediate different problems in different ways, you know, I think is also a good strategy. 
but it, it but, and maybe they did, they did that in Northern Ireland and, and after the Good Friday Agreement they then also had you know these commissions to talk about the police and talk about weapons decommissioning as well but despite all that there's still there's uh, there was still a lack as far as I was concerned of an ability to almost like post-operative care you know there wasn't enough of it and I think there needs to be more of that almost as a support to the politicians who are very exposed you know if you're in a conflict and you then reach a mediated settlement you're immediately going to be accused of treachery by somebody in your side who wasn't part or not getting any of the spoils of war you know etc so you've got to protect yourself against that and a lot of these people were exposed uh subsequently and that was probably a negative i think northern Ireland's case francesca you have one question i would say the last question maybe for today thank you um Picking on what you said before in terms of the possibility of an independence referendum and the fact that, you know, the, the need to have a project to look for the future that you kind of unites, um, how, how far the possibility of independence as a kind of breakthrough for Northern Ireland could be? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a very interesting one. Um, there's always been sort of uh, a constituency that supported independence, but it's been quite a small one, and it is generally well in the past it has been much more associated with the unionist side of the community, partly because they were in the majority and they probably could see a security and independence and it tended to be whenever you know like the anglo-irish agreement or when when england when the british did things they didn't like and so we, we need a stronger buffer against perfidious albion um but nationalists would run 100 miles from independence a because you know it is almost taking partition and guilt and gilding it in in you know gold leaf uh, so, so ideologically, a lot of certainly on the Republican side would see that as you know, uh, not what the 1916 Easter Rising was for, or even what the IRA's armed struggle, as they would call it, was about in the 70s and 80s. And 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 also, uh, there there's um, there's a growing alternative. Uh, constituency there, but it's not necessarily uh, like a Northern Ireland um, identity. I would say it's it's quite often that sort of a progressive liberal, young urban vote. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I think there would be worries about uh, that morphing into a Northern Ireland o only identity. And then there's lots of economic questions about how viable would Northern Ireland be as an independent country. So I, I don't really see that as an option. I, I think where we're going to go is uh, we're going to go towards, at least I, this is my best guess on what's going to happen. Um, it partly depends on how, how problematic Brexit continues to be. Brexit beds in and the protocol, get, you know, Europe gets an agreement with Britain, protocol becomes less obvious. Um, the status quo becomes more viable then, I think. And a lot of nationalists were quite happy with the status quo up until Brexit. Didn't really want to see themselves as separatists. But what they're faced with now is living in Northern Ireland, living in the United Kingdom outside the European Union, outside the legal protections that the EU provides uh, on human rights and other things. And that's a different equation. So it's pushed a lot of nationalists towards being more amenable, towards reunification. So what you're likely to get is... Um, the people who support the union trying to present a sort of civic unionism, you know, a, a, a not just a Protestant orange, anti-Irish language type of culture, but one that's inclusive. I mean, that's certainly what the new leader of the Ulster Unionist Party is trying to engineer, uh, is that more inclusive sense of the union, the National Health Service, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the a sort of a economic model that is attractive. Uh, that it allows na nationalists and respects the nationalist culture. 
within the union. They're trying to broaden it out. Uh, that's where they're going to go. And I think where Irish nationalists will go will be to try and say, if you want to be in the EU, there's, well, the way to get back into the European Union is, is to vote for Irish unity. Um, also, they're probably going to try and maybe develop ideas that doesn't just look like, like Northern Ireland has been shoveled into an, a 32 county state, but maybe a form of federalism where Belfast remains, you know, where unionists have a buffer against Dublin, uh, where possibly even unionists might get seats in an Irish government provided for them or Northern Ireland would to try and break up that traditional model of what unity means and provide, a, give, give this non-aligned sector more to buy into than they currently might think they've got. And I think that's where the next several years is going to go. I don't think it's going to go towards an independence movement.